So I think we're all here. We are complete. Go ahead. I see also the candidate. I don't see the candidate. Is that correct? That's correct. So we'll wait for the candidate then. Here he is again. Yeah, okay. So good morning, everybody in the Netherlands. It's uh, good morning. Uh, welcome in the online defense of uh, Mr. Teddy uh, Yoti Karan, who will defend that away, Oud. Who will defend his thesis, Tales of Distance and Togetherness, going beyond the dichotomy of traditional versus modern images of intergenerational family relationship in South India. I welcome everybody uh, in this uh, online uh, session for this defense, and of course, uh, family and friends, but also the supervisors, Professor Krumeij, uh, Dr. Meersuk, and Dr. Ashok, and of course, the members of the opposition who will. Meet uh, you will meet them uh, very very soon. But first, we start with a short presentation of the candidate uh, about his work. Okay, Doctor, Mr. Candidate, Mr. Yoti Karan, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Uh, yes, uh, it seems we have a small technical difficulty with the candidate. He got just got disconnected from the meeting. He okay. is in back now. So we are trying to make everything work again. Okay, welcome again. Uh, See, ah, Teddy, yes, the Mr. candidate is back. Um, Can yeah. you hear us, Teddy? Yes, I could. Okay. okay, I've already opened the session and announced that you're going to hold the presentation. So the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Okay, so let me share my screen. Yes. Is my screen visible? Uh, yes, it's good now. Okay. Thank Go you. Ahead. Dear Pro-Rector, dear members of the Corona, dear family, friends and audience, in the coming 15 minutes, I will shortly present a summary of my thesis entitled Tales of Distance and Togetherness, Going Beyond the Dichotomy of Traditional versus Modern Images of Intergenerational Family Relationships in South India. Historically, Multi-generational families with elderly parents, their adult children, and their grandchildren forming a household have been seen as a characteristic tradition within Indian society. Globalization and modernization have caused, uh, have caused changes in living arrangements of families, resulting in changes in the intergenerational relationship. In aging studies in India, the change from traditional to nuclear living arrangements is largely seen as negative as it undermines the traditional care system for the elderly. Although the national policies concerning elderly care and many NGOs and other organizations attempt to address the erosion of traditional values, none of their attempts seem to compensate for the negative effect of changes in living arrangements on the well-being of older adults. However, not all studies are somber about the impact of modern living arrangements on elders' well-being. A few studies that Older adult uh, reports that older adults, for example, view private space, limited children's interference, and independent decision making opportunities as benefits brought in by the modern arrangement. However, none of these studies has taken an in depth look at how the family members themselves perceive and experience the changing living arrangement and its impact on the elderly and their uh, adult children's well being. With this background, my study was based on the reflections made by medical anthropologists like Kleinman on culture, an interpretivist and emic approach to study the culture allow us to understand what people experience, how they give meaning to those experiences, and how this meaning is expressed in things people do in response to these explanations of reality. These explanations of reality and the things done in response are seen as the expressions of culture, embodying cultural norms and values. Hence, comparing and contrasting the interpretations and experiences of different stakeholders help pictureize and understand the plurality in a way members of a similar culture respond to changes brought about by the outside world. 
Applying this interpretive approach to changes in living arrangements in the backdrop of globalization, I try to understand how the older adults experience, explain and respond to intergenerational change, how this differs from the experiences, explanations and responses of their children, and consequently, how the gap between these two sets of experiences, explanations and responses impact the well-being of both the groups. Further, I compare these findings with how professionals perceive challenges in intergenerational relationships in modern times, and how do they address those challenges? Against this background, my study aims to reveal what the differences and similarities are in the way different stakeholders, including older adults, adult children, and professionals experience and perceive changes in intergenerational relationships and how they address, resolve the challenges in those relationships. While answering the first sub-question, as indicated by old adults, I expanded the interviews to study the role of spirituality in shaping the quality of intergenerational relationships according to old adults. To capture the perceptions and experiences of different stakeholders, I used a qualitative interpretive framework and conducted the study in two South Indian states, namely Tamil Nadu and Telangana. In first round, 26 older adults, 26 adult children, and 12 professionals were interviewed to understand the way spirituality affects the quality of intergenerational relationship. 25 more older adults were interviewed. The interview transcripts were fed into NVO9 to encode the stakeholder-wise responses and identified range of issues concerning intergenerational relationships raised by them using thematic analysis framework. The analysis of older adults' data reveal that they do recognize the demanding nature of their children's work, which keeps them far busier with jobs outside the house before, than before, and permit little time for family life and care duties. Yet, while it has become more difficult for adult children to take care of their parents, the elders remain satisfied with the situation and sometimes even stress the benefits of privacy and independence as long as their children show that they have remained committed to traditional values. The interviews paint a nuanced picture that reciprocity rooted in traditional values continue to exist in modern times and generate a sense of belongingness among the older adults irrespective of living arrangements. However, not all older adults report of positive experiences. Few participants in both living arrangements report of strained relationship with their kin and experienced difficulty to cope with the changes in the living arrangement. Zooming through the lenses of older adults reported of positive experiences, remaining in contact, support exchange with their children and their participation in resolving family conflicts and decision-making help them feel meaningful, appreciated, and productive. These experiences reflect that the sense of belonging seemed to be more important than the older adult, uh, more important for the older adults than the living arrangement per se. Besides, older adults perceive the autonomy, freedom, and control brought in by the modern arrangement helps them to build the network of social relationships beyond the family context. In my attempt to understand the role of spirituality in the intergenerational relationships, older adults, particip old adult participants spoke about two ways in which spirituality helps. One, spirituality is perceived to build their personal resources. Regular participation in spiritual activities helps them feel composed and at peace, which is seen as a basis for developing other personal resources like patience and empathetic understanding towards their kin in general. These resources are felt to help them deal with conflicts and disputes more positively, strengthening their relationship with their kin. For the older adults having strained relationships with their children, spiritual thoughts, meditation, and prayers help develop their resources, including acceptance and forgiveness, which enables them to develop positive feeling towards their kin. Secondly, spirituality creates structures through which older adults and their family members jointly participate in several spiritual activities and the exchange of knowledge and values helps strengthen their, the emotional bonding between them in both traditional and modern households. Furthermore, the spiritual structure created by religious groups and NGOs helps older adults to expand their social networks. This expansion of social networks was perceived to benefit in two ways. 
One, it reduces the stress on the quality of family relationships. Secondly, it facilitates developing non-kin relationships in the neighborhood for those who feel disconnected from their kin, strengthening the feeling that they have a purpose and meaning in life. Coming to adult children's views, the interviews reveal the struggle the adult children in both joint and nuclear households face in balancing the demands of modern life and traditional expectations of their older relatives. They feel their older kin's stubbornness and rigidity in their, in their expectations add burden and complexity to their lives. Nevertheless, they respect the cultural value of being united, even though they live apart by maintaining regular contact and supporting the older kin when required, deferring to claims of many studies that report that family values are breaking down due to changes in living arrangements. To deal with these complexities, adult children use several strategies. One, unlike earlier practices of the oldest male child and his family taking the entire care responsibility, they share the elder care ta related tasks with their siblings, which enhances their passion for caring for their parents. My study hints at a change in gender stereotype that sons, sons-in-law, also take more active caregiving roles in modern times. Secondly, instead of focusing on the challenges caused by older relatives, inflexible nature, and traditional expectations, participants concentrate more on the larger benefits they receive from them in terms of emotional, economic, and instrumental support. This focus on benefits helps them develop a sense of acceptance towards the nature of their older relatives, which enables them to integrate the care tasks as part of their daily routine. How did the professionals see the family dynamics? The participants see a decrease in reciprocity of care and support in families. Self-centeredness, lack of empathy, and limited efforts to maintain contact are reported to be evidence for the change in the value system among adult children. On the other side, according to the participants, care expectations of older kin remain traditional. This trend they feel seems to have a negative impact on intergenerational bonding and support, and also on the quality of life of older adults. Besides, the drop in economic productivity of the older adults are perceived to add to the friction in the family relationship. Based on this understanding, professionals develop and implement two broad sets of interventions. One, they deliver awareness programs for the younger generation in schools and colleges, reinforcing cultural awareness and to develop a better sense of empathy towards older adults. Few organizations create structure for the multi-generational family to come together to celebrate the accomplishments of the older adults of the family. Second set of interventions include empowerment initiatives and support services. According to the socioeconomic status of the older adults, they design several initiatives including pre-retirement programs to help older adults plan their life in superannuation period. Another initiative is the formation of self-help groups to engage elders in small-scale businesses. Thirdly, they design elders collective to promote peer support in the neighborhood, besides to develop independence among the older adults. They've delivered volunteer-enabled support service interventions. By using these services, professionals see that the older adults develop extended social relationships outside the family convoy and enjoy a better sense of belongingness. This is particularly very helpful for those who have strained relationship with family members. They also highlighted the roadblocks to scale up the interventions, which includes limited cooperation from education institutions, lack of financial and human resources, limited government support and poor media coverage. Analyzing the perspectives of different stakeholders unearthed the importance of going beyond the dichotomy of traditional versus modern patterns of intergenerational relationships in the change conditions. The traditional values, which in many studies were reported to be disappearing, continue to exist. However, they are expressed in newer, modern ways according to socioeconomic changes in the society and living arrangements. Although older adults and their ch adult children struggle with change conditions, I observe compassion on both sides and efforts to make it work because they value intergenerational relationships. Adult children use a task, task sharing model to care for their older relatives and consciously focus on larger benefits received from their older kin, rather than the problems caused by traditional expectations. Whereas older adults use structures created by civil society organizations 
and spiritual groups to strengthen the quality of relationship with their kin and develop an extended network of social relations. In their attempts to support families to address the gaps they perceive in family relations, professionals seem to overlook these attempts of families to shape their relationship in new ways. Acknowledgement of these attempts may help professionals to better attune their activities to experiences and needs of the families. To conclude, I would like to emphasize, instead of approaching the quality of intergenerational relationships and their effect on old adults' well-being from a problem perspective, adopting a pragmatic approach would uncover more nuanced relational dynamics in the families and the extended social networks, bringing all these stakeholders to a similar level of understanding and engaging them in the intergenerational work and creating appropriate structures in communities is crucial to facilitate the new ways adopted by the stakeholders in expressing emotional bonding and family sentiments. Future studies need to capture the coexistence and coevolution of cultural ethos and the newer relational dynamics, which would help design programs and policies. To take the intergenerational work forward, an integrated effort of all stakeholders, including the family members of all generations, professionals, the state, media, and social resources like schools and religious groups are highly essential. Thank you for your attention. I give now the word back to the floor rector. Thank you, Mr. Candidate, for a uh, nice presentation. We start the opposition now. And we start with the chair of the assessment committee, and that is Prof Professor Zwakhal, who is pr professor of nursing science in the Department of Health Services Research in the University of Maastricht. The floor is yours, Professor Zwakhal. Thank you, Professor Nayers. Dear candidates, uh, first of all, congratulations. I think it's a great achievement. And um, uh, we heard that you combined a job with your PhD in Maastricht, which is probably an extra achievement. Uh, and uh, congratulations on that. A well-written thesis on an important topic. I think that's what we all agree on. And also my congratulations to your support team at home, but also at the universities. Um, I would like to discuss in more detail two things with you. I will start with an overarching, more general question and then focus on chapters five. Um, this first question, this more general question, relates to the fact that you use the triangulation of resources. And you, you, you used uh, different informers like the older adults or the adults, the uh, informal caregivers or the relatives, but also the formal caregivers. And I think that's highly valuable and highly appreciated. But I wondered uh, why you didn't use this triangulation in the different approaches and the different methods, research methods that you use. You mainly or solely focus on the interviews. And I wondered if that was a, a, a purposeful choice or that why not focus or use other resources, which may have come up with different information, which might be valuable. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit more on that? Mm -hmm. uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, um, you know, we have to, um, you know, uh, use the, this approach it's because, you know, of course, originally we were thinking to, you know, um, look at more from an ethnographical perspective, where probably, you know, if there is a possibility that we can probably be there in the families, try to see what sort of uh, intergenerational interactions that are taking place. But however, um, you know, of course, we started recruiting um, participants for our study, uh, you know, with the old adults. And then we tried to kind of link it to, um, you know, and then try to connect with the um, uh, other younger relatives in the family. But however, you know, we could achieve and also uh, we could achieve only in around six to seven families where we could actually, uh, you know, uh, contact the older adults and their younger relatives. And we could not, you know, because of, um, you know, because of, uh, um, you know, the non-availability of the younger ones. So because of which, you know, we have to kind of depend on the in-depth interviews. Okay. And do you think if you had, because you mentioned like observations, huh? looking into this more detail, would have, do you think that you would have gathered other information or additional information or what? Can you? Yes. Yes. Certainly, yes. It could have been a little more closer and accurate and definitely like, you know, 
seeing them in the situation would have definitely you know given us um, much more clarity and much more uh, 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 you know uh, much more specific uh, responses from them or information about the you know the whole intergenerational relationship how it is changing and how do they kind of uh, respond to these and what it means to them so definitely yes we could have okay okay but provided provided you know if if i get a chance to do it probably a postdoc or something yes we will try okay but, so it was more a pragmatic choice which would have been feasible within the within the within the context that you've investigated okay right then I would like to, uh, because the time is limited, so I will go further on to my second question and which focuses more on chapter five, in which you focus on the perceptions of the professional caregiver. And you describe some issues that may have occurred and you also uh, presented them in your, uh, just before. And you also address some strategies to overcome these problems. And the first strategy is to revitalize these traditional uh, family relationships hmm, to awareness problems. And the second one is to include more to empower the older adults. Uh, but you also mentioned some barriers, eh? uh, a lack of governmental support, not prior, prior, prioritizing these, poor media, etc. So my question is, what should be done? Is these strategies, are these really implementable? Because, well, you already do elaborate that they are not. And are these evidence-based? Uh, can you say something more about that? Okay. So, yes, I think, you know, these strategies do work to some extent, I mean, to a great extent. And, you know, because that's what the feedback that I received from, uh, you know, from the professionals themselves, that it is bringing in behavioral change in the young people, particularly uh, you know, based on the school-based awareness programs. Uh, and at the same time, um, you know, depending on the socioeconomic conditions of the older adults, yeah, they do provide empowerment, um, you know, empowerment interventions. Uh, and also they use the support service interventions to provide support, which of course it is helpful. But however, I think the only thing that uh, probably they need to consider is to recognize uh, the way, the newer ways that the adult children are expressing their values, which I feel is kind of, you know, missing in these interventions. So probably uh, the professionals need to kind of consider uh, bringing in those, you know, probably are, you know, try to uh, design some interventions wherein they can also include the um, adult children in the process. And also probably, yes, you know, how it can be. So one of the ways that I felt is, you know, probably, um, you know, having some sort of um, leave provisions, for example, because, you know, they really, many of them, they wanted to really provide care for their parents, but however, because of the demands of, you know, the modern life and workspace, uh, they're not able to provide the complete care. So they still feel that, you know, they can do much better. So probably, you know, in the companies or the workspaces, they have, you know, maternity, paternity leave. So similarly, they can have parental care leaves, for example. You know, so these could actually kind of facilitate uh, these sort of things. So that that is more from a kind of a you know policy perspective that I'm talking about. But when it comes to the strategies, yes, you know, probably they can also try and see that you know instead of you know they do a lot of team building um, activities in companies. So probably they can do a family building activities. Probably not you know um, very often, but you know once a year or so, so that you know like that could be more. Uh, uh, you know, they, that could be more understanding and also they could develop. But again, this is not possible with all the families. This is possible with the families where there are positive relationship and the quality of relationship is intact, okay? And also there is a sense of belongingness by the older adults. But whereas when it comes to the, um, you know, older adults who do not have such a positive relationship, with them, more of volunteer enabled interventions would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Given the time, I hand it over to the pro-rector again. Thanks for your uh, deliberation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Swakal. And now we come to the uh, second member of the assessment committee, that is Professor uh, Irudaya Rayan. He's for the Center of, for Developmental Studies in Theory of Nature Puram in Kerala, India. And thank you for coming all the way from India, albeit online, because the University of Maastricht is always glad to receive guests from outside. The floor is yours. You have to unmute. Yeah. 
thank you thank you professor and uh, dear uh, student uh, i really enjoyed reading your thesis i think uh, something which uh, you know i i get lot of thesis to read but i think one of the thesis recently read was uh, you know this was a very excellent work i just have uh, you know some uh, what is called the clarification and little bit to expand your uh, your ideas one is uh, you have uh, discussed in your presentation about this your sampling you, you have said that convenient sampling of 26 elderly adults and 25 elderly adults now how did you recruit them because you know is there any even it was convenient do you had any particular Uh, criteria to select them or drop them or you know something i would like to elaborate on that yeah <clears throat> uh thank you very much highly esteemed doctor yes um yes we had criteria and basically you know uh, we wanted um older adults first we started with older adults as i said earlier and uh, so we started recruiting them uh, uh ngos and also through the senior citizen associations but the criteria that we used were of course they should be uh, able to um, you know listen and respond to the questions and also we ensured that we have distribution of all rathers and of course other um, you know adult children also in a diverse socio economic conditions and also from the you know from the rural urban, you know those distribution we also ensure uh, so we had our participants from you know a uh, uh, very well educated and also uh, economically sound background and also we had uh, uh, you know women i mean older adults and the uh, adult children living in slums um, and also similarly in the in rural areas so we ensured that you know we had a very diverse so that what the main purpose is to kind of capture the plurality of experiences and perceptions that older adults have i mean the participants have uh to develop further on that you know uh, your study is focused on two states in south india okay now assuming that somebody is doing similar research or similar framework similar older adults in say north india another two states in north india you think the findings will be almost similar or you think that you have offered something different than that uh it could be yes and no i would say because you know definitely i'm sure you know the you know the in certain ways yes the cultural values are similar across india but at the same time the way it coevolves the in the pace it coevolves it is very different from south and north for example again in north india if you if you see delhi around okay so there probably yes it's more or less similar to the south india but whereas if you go down to you know the uh, northeastern not not northeast extreme but you know towards um you know uh, jharkhand and that side it is kind of probably it is still more traditional and also similarly in bihar and also if we go to towards um you know some parts of maharashtra yeah it it could be still traditional uh but you know but again you know like what i probably the key things that i am contributing to the existing knowledge is that uh because earlier these studies have talked more about you know how things are changing and they are, the way it was focused was more problematic they they the way they saw the intergenerational relationships and the gaps so the kind of key contribution of my study was i think you know no it is not just that it is also that you know uh, there are people still you know expressing their traditional values and obligations in newer forms so which we also need to consider when we think about the policies and the programs um so that's something that i thought you know that i felt it is new okay uh finally uh, uh, one more question is that uh, you were talking in you know very much on spirituality plays a role i think i do agree with that but last uh, two years we have covid we have covid and then churches temples all are closed and i know a lot of stress among the old people and also especially the covid 19 we also told the old people should not come out so i think what is your take on that spirituality has gone to the completely derived of course you have online services of people but they are not meeting they are not going and uh, meeting their own cohorts of old people i would like to have a comment on that <laughs> thank you very much um 
highly esteemed opponent to a very interesting question. Um, yes, it, it is definitely, I think I see there are a couple of um, takes, I mean, a uh, couple of ways that it could have impacted. One is what I noticed was um, probably, of course, not you know within my research thing, but from my reading, from also with consultations, I found that in some families um, where they are digitally literate and who can connect with their relatives and also other people online, yes. So what has happened is the families where the they you know that the quality of relationship is strong. So what they've done is they started meeting online you know, on a monthly basis or on a week or doing prayers and just, you know, getting together, and doing some online games and things like that. So that way they remain connected. <clears throat> Whereas, yes, the older, particularly the older adults in, uh, you know, the, uh, from more, you know, socioeconomically background population or the community, there it is slightly different. I mean, not slightly, it's very different because um, you know, they had to suffer and they don't have any devices or any mediums to connect with people. And also, uh, as you rightly said, you know, the religious platforms are closed. And however, there were few places. I mean, not, I cannot say everywhere, but in some places, yes, there were uh, the community-based volunteers and also those probably belong to certain religion. And also there are some uh, secular volunteers who went around providing some sort of support. And also, of course, as they distributed the whatever uh, required goods. So they kind of, you know, developed that sort of a sense. So okay. that's, these are the two things that I see. Okay. Thank you, thank you. I'm giving back to Pro Rector, please. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Iridaya Rayan. Now we come to the third member of the assessment committee and that's Dr. Gul. She's a lecturer in social works in the University of South Australia. And I thank you also for coming all the way from Australia. Dr. Hu. You have to unmute. Thank you, sir, for uh, being inviting me uh, to be part of uh, Teddy's uh, conference process. Um, first of all, my heartiest congratulations to you, uh, Teddy, and the supervisory team for the wonderful work that you have done. Um, I really enjoyed thoroughly reading your thesis and the book and chapters that you have published, uh, which clearly shows uh, the work and its relevance uh, and its currency in today's time. Um, Teddy, I, I have a couple of questions that are related to the methodology section. Um, and after uh, listening to your presentation today, I think my first question is being answered quite well, but still I would just like to uh, ask you to explain it a little bit further around the methodology, the approach that you have selected for your study, which is emic and etic approach. Um, if you could explain how this was uh, relevant to study the phenomena that is intergenerational relationships between amongst the, you know, older adults and the uh, younger adult population group. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you, esteemed opponent, for the wishes and also for the question. <clears throat> yes. Actually, you know, um, as I said, it was inspired from the, uh, you know, reflections of uh, anthropologists like clean men on culture. So basically what we tried to do was we wanted to kind of look from an insider perspective, basically because, you know, we are kind of, you know, trying to understand the, um, you know, patterns of relationship and trying to compare across different generations. And, uh, um, and also, of course, you know, different generation and also different uh, regions. So for which, um, you know, we, we wanted to kind of, uh, um, you know, look how they actually kind of experience and also what it means to them. And also how do they respond, you know, and how do they respond particularly in the context of globalization or probably in the context of how the outer, you know, outside world is kind of putting pressure on them. All right. So because of which, yes, um, you know, we thought okay, using a emic approach would be like, you know, which is like, uh, you know, taking a looking at um, participants through their eyes or participants experiences through their eyes would be more helpful. And of course, uh, you know, one of the limitation, what I said earlier was, yes, we could not do more of an ethnographic, uh, you know, uh, methods, but however, 
you know, we could do in-depth interviews to get. And also, yes, in order to kind of do that, yes, you know, being trained in mental health, yes, you know, I could really kind of, uh, you know, uh, build up rapport, particularly in the place, because, you know, in one, of the, one of the states selected for my study is my own native state. Of course, it, it came randomly, but, um, you know, so I could kind of speak in the local language and I could really kind of, you know, uh, help them to be more open and comfortable with interviews. And also, of course, I gave a few other things, a uh, few other, uh, uh, um, you know, discussions I had to help them feel more comfortable and more open to um, their sharing their experiences. Thank you, Teddy, for that. Um, my next question is related to what uh, Dr. Rajan has already asked. So it was related to recruitment. I think you have given a very good explanation on that. Um, how you have selected uh, the participants group. I'm just keen to know a little bit more about uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the older population group. Uh, in all uh, the, you know, the socioeconomic or the plurality that you selected, like you, you selected participants from different um, socioeconomic background, and you also made sure that they are from rural as well as urban and they belong to every strata. But besides this, did you also have, you know, kind of where you felt like this will be um, the inclusion criteria age-wise or, uh, you know, any other aspect or exclusion? Yes. No, of course, you know, we, we followed age-wise also, you know, those who are, you know, 55 or 60 and above, but however, I think, you know, when we went onto the field and then we saw that there are already few uh, women who actually attain the position of grandparenthood or, you know, grand, grandparentship. Um, so because, of, you know, and then we felt, okay, and also uh, in the kind of discussion I had, initial discussion I had with them, uh, I found that, yes, you know, they all experience, you know, um, certain things probably which could add value to my research. So because of which, yes, there are there was one um, one participant who I included as older adult who was 48 years old, if I remember correctly. And also there were um, two or three, you know, who were aged 55 and 58, so like that. So um, so of course, yeah, we, we did have, but however, I think it's more of based on their uh, functionality or the role that they're playing, we also kind of you know, uh, um, made it a little more flexible with that. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation, Teddy. Um, um, I think that explains the results and the findings that you have discussed. Um, just related to that, um, I would like to know your experience. Very, of, very you know, short question. Very short question. Very short answer, please. Okay. Uh, so in terms of like, you, you have selected participants from different backgrounds. So where do you see, um, how, how does that compare when you got their findings? Like you have mentioned in different quotes, but could you just summarize and say um, how their experiences were different from coming from a elite class and from a lower socioeconomic class? And a short answer, please. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> no, I think, you know, they, their experiences you know, irrespective of their, um, you know, the socioeconomic background and uh, rural or urban, I think, you know, that one thing that probably are two things that came out was um, many of them, yes, they felt, you know, uh, they, they uh, both older adults and adult children, they wanted to be connected, right? So through, you know, being in contact with them regularly and providing support and, you know, receiving support, and also by engaging themselves in decision-making processes in the family. So through that, you know, of course, probably it is not this, probably, you know, um, same everywhere, but yes, there are few here and there, there might be some sort of imbalance, but how are this is what? And then a small number of yes participants did express that they do have a strained relationship, which, you know, they were not able to connect with their children and for which they could actually, you know, connect them, connect with the extended network through various social resources. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you. Thank you.
Dr. Gul. Now we come to the following member of the assessment committee, is Professor van den Borne, who is Emeritus Professor of Patient Education in the Department of Health Promotion in the University of Maastricht. And he has also accepted the role of secretary of this committee today, for which I'm very grateful. Professor van den Borne. You have to unmute. Thank you, Professor Nayars. Dear candidates, I've read your dissertation with great interest. As you have stated, the impact of the strong socioeconomic changes that are also affecting the family structure and uh, the living arrangement of the older people in India and the influence thereof on the quality of life of the people and the elderly in particular is not very well understood. Your study is, in this context, is timely and very important. In particular, good qualitative research greatly helps to understand these processes of change. My compliments for your work. However, I do have a few issues I don't clearly understand, and I would like to discuss this with you, and I will build upon your, the question of uh, Dr. Uh, Kapalna Goel, that you already addressed, but I would like to go with you a little bit in more detail. Uh, you, in your research, you, you have this qualitative approach um, and conceptually you have this emic approach in your uh, research. Um, I would like to, well, no, first, did you do all interviews uh, yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, esteemed, highly esteemed opponent for the question. Uh, yes, out, I mean, I did almost, um, the, yes, most interviews, uh, particularly, um, you know, the interviews that I could do it in English and also in Tamil, which is my native language, which I said, that's one of the states which I was, which was selected for the study. So there, yes, all the interviews I did myself. And then in the state of Telangana, which of course, uh, the interviews that could be done in English, I did. And then the local, um, you know, the other, uh, in the rural areas and other, uh, you know, um, with other participants who have, who don't have so much of literacy. So with them, I had a research assistant who helped me with the interviews. Okay, thank you. And. Going into the details of those interviewing, because you had this emic approach, and I I'm very interested in how you um, implemented that emic approach. For example, in in your questions, your the structure of your questions. How how did that go? That process of questioning. Did you have focus points in your? interview, how, how did you go about that? I didn't find that so much, particularly uh, in chapter two. I didn't find that much information on that. Could you explain a little bit more on the content and how, and the process of that interviewing and how you implemented that ENIC approach in your interviewing? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. That's an interesting question. Uh, yes, so how I went ahead was um, you know, um, of course, I kind of first I went there and I've, you know, in some participants I recruited through NGOs and some participants through senior citizen associations. So in NGOs, what I did was, yes, when I approached them, I already kind of had a kind of a brief session of just inquiring them what they're doing, how are they, and, you know, what are they doing regularly and things like that. And then subsequently, I went for the interviews. And in those interviews, how did I start was since I already kind of met them before. So I started with like generally, you know, what are the, you know, the last two weeks, what are the different activities you were involved in? And then I asked them like, you know, how does a typical day look? And then, so what sort of social engagements that they are, you know, that they are involved in on a day-to-day -day basis? And with who are the key people uh, that, you know, they are in touch with or they constantly connect with? Yeah, and particularly, and then came down to family and also the others in the, um, you know, the uh, next social circle and asked them like, you know, how important 
um, you know, um, how important are those people and in what way, you know, uh, you kind of relate with them and what sort of activities you uh, do with them and what do they like, um, you know, from them and then how, uh, you know, what are the kind of uh, challenges you face in relating with them. So, you know, that's how I build it on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have another question regarding the socioeconomic differences in India. If you look at the Indian population, India has um, great differences, for example, in socioeconomic status of the people. Right? The, um, uh, maybe it has something to do with the old caste system, I don't know, but um, the differences are big. And particularly thinking of your study of the elder, uh, elderly people, um, my question is why didn't you focus more on the possible effect of the socioeconomic status of your participants? I know you had, uh, in your selection of your participants, you had uh, uh, also richer people and poorer families. But I don't think that your design was very clear in terms of clarifying, for example, the possible effects of the social status of people. I can imagine that people Poor people are less, uh, will not uh, migrate that much, uh, for example, and participate uh, in the more modern uh, structure okay. of the economy. So, and, and which may have big effects on the family structure. Why, what is your thinking about the, the differences in socioeconomic status? and? Do you think that your research covered that enough? Please, a very, very short answer. Thank you. Uh, yes, I do see, yes, it, it does, the socioeconomic status does um, shape the quality of relationship. Uh, but however, I think, you know, because of the globalization, even though they are from or of social ba socioeconomic background, but still the migration is taking place among them as well, also in the rural areas. Okay. And also even there, I noticed that, yes, there are two kinds of families where one set of families still, even though they move apart with all whatever struggles they have, they would like to kind of continue providing support and care and, you know, uh, build the quality of relationship. And also there are a few people who still, um, you know, kind of, they could not do that. So okay. they kind of, you know, have strained relationships. Okay, thank you. thank you for your answer. I give the, the floor back to uh, Professor Nyers. Thank you, Professor van der Barne. Then we come to Professor Bailey, who uh, has a chair in social urban transition in the international uh, development studies, the Department of Human Geography and Spatial Planning in the University of Utrecht. And welcome also from Utrecht. Thank you, uh, Professor Nyhaus. Uh, dear candidate, first, my congratulations on an excellent piece of work, also to the supervisory team. Your work uh, immensely contributes to this growing literature of using more lived experiences of older adults in a research infrastructure that is always more quantitative or doesn't bring out the voices of people so clearly. So in that sense, your work contributes towards that. It contributes to building up new ideas around family, uh, family relationships and intergenerational relationships. So in that way, I was quite happy uh, to read your thesis. So far, we have had a lot of discussion on the methodology of it and on uh, how you went about conducting it. Um, I would like to take you a bit further on to discuss uh, what kind of theoretical frameworks or models or conceptual frameworks guided your research? Um, and where, uh, and if, if these concepts or frameworks are present, what kind of contributions are you making towards gerontological theory, for example? And I'll have a follow-up after that. Thank you. Yeah, 
So, um, of course, you know, we did try to look at the different, um, you know, for example, intergenerational solidarity model and also social, ex so, uh, social exchange models. But however, I think, you know, the, since, you know, our, uh, the, the research question was quite new and, you know, not much studies have been done. So we don't want to take that sort of a, a, a you know, kind of a, a framework. So we wanted to kind of root it more from a, a emic perspective and try to kind of look through, uh, you know, look through the eyes of the different stakeholders who are involved in these uh, relationships. So, um, so that's how, you know, we try, kind of try to root our um, approach in, um, you know, medical anthropological reflections of culture and try to kind of um, understand, uh, you know, see the kind of experiences people go through and what sort of meaning do they give to that and also uh, how do they respond, you know, in spite of this, uh, um, in spite of various uh, pressures from the uh, outside world that they, that they could probably, you know, kind of co-evolve some of these practices. Right. Um, I mean, I'm happy you brought up the issue around anthropological uh, theory. You mentioned it, and there are a few instances where you talk about these lenses that people use. I'm wondering, so what does it contribute to? What definition of culture or cultural norms are you trying to get to? Or uh, what do these lenses mean? Are you talking about more from a cultural meaning system perspective or cultural schemas? Where where can I see or where can I theoretically root this experience? I think, yes, it, it is more from the social schemas, you know, where, because, you know, of course, you know, people go with, of course, they are already kind of conditioned with certain patterns of culture. And then when they try to kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, um, face the outside world, which is kind of slowly changing, and each one, probably it could be of the same, stakeholder group, or it could be from um, different stakeholder group. So the way they kind of uh, receive it and assimilate it, and then kind of, you know, uh, uh, express um, themselves. So that, then expressing the values, so that is probably, uh, um, you know, uh, something that I felt uh, that, you know, uh, these schemas that they uh, use in order to express themselves is something that, uh, you know, that was helpful for my study. And towards the last question I have, uh, a lot of the discussion in your thesis is on families, right? On intergenerational relationships. And if you had to take out this family focused or familist kind of reasoning into care and look at other dimensions of care of non-family caregivers or non-family support, do you think you would have had different results? Um, um, can you, can I request you to repeat the question? Uh, suppose, so a, a large part of your thesis focuses on family and family dynamics. So, uh, you know, the reasoning that the traditional family or the new versions of this family, the family as being the core element of caregiving, right? If you take out that lens and use non-family caregivers or older adults themselves providing, being caregivers in this process, of non-family elements. So if you take out the family lens, as you use the term in your uh, chapters, what would be different? What would we see difference in there? Yeah, I think, you know, probably, yes. Um, in some way, I think that is also kind of, um, you know, uh, coming up from my study that, you know, there are these uh, volunteer enabled support services. You know, talked about in my books. So probably when the family is not, um, you know, uh, probably, you know, not a, having positive relationship. So obviously there are these various religious and social structures, which were, um, which were actually kind of uh, brought in and then they, uh, you know, kind of set up, uh, they, um, you know, they recruit volunteers in order to provide support. Uh, and uh, so that what happens is even though the older adults kind of, uh, um, you know, could not be in touch with family members, but still they could, uh, uh, um, you know, they could actually have an extended network of family relationships or probably in other words, non-fictive kins. Thanks a lot. I give the floor back to the director. 
Thank you very much for your position, Professor Bailey. Now we come to the last opponent, that's Dr. De Jong, and she's Associate Professor uh, of Healthcare Education in the University of Maastricht. Dr. De Jong. Thank you, Professor Nijhuis. Uh, dear candidates, I would like to contribute to the discussion by asking you uh, questions relating to education, but not before I uh, want to congratulate you with the completion of your thesis, Tales of Distance and Togetherness. Congratulations. Thank you. You wrote an interesting uh, uh, paragraph, impact paragraph, starting on page 156. And on this page, you write, and I cite, we plan to start a center for research, training, and advocacy in gerontology in Manipal, India. A bit further, you write, the center will be designed to serve three broad purposes. The first purpose is to build a resource and training center. The second purpose addresses bridging the gaps between research uh, and practice and policy. And I would like to focus on the third purpose. The third purpose is, and I cite, to, to make them less dependent on their younger relatives and support them to adjust to modern time, times. The center will offer lifelong learning experiences for older adults by opening a university of third age space and providing opportunities for older adults to continue their education in their area of interest. End of citation. I'm aware you're planning to start a center, so you are in a thinking, a designing stage. Uh, but the following part in this citation, lifelong learning experiences and a university of third age space generates my attention. So what do you mean by lifelong learning experiences? And what do you mean by a university of third age space. Could you please uh, explain this? Yeah. Thank you, dear esteemed uh, opponent for the question. Yes. Um, so basically there are few uh, universities um, in Europe, particularly in Malta, I've come across that there is a university of third age, third age. So basically meant for older adults. And so here, of course, in India, we don't have any as of now. So what I would like to propose through this is to kind of set up a space where the older adults from different background, they can come enroll with us. And also if they wanted to kind of learn something new or probably which they had, um, which probably they felt they missed to kind of learn in the earlier stages of their development. And now they wanted to learn, probably it could be related to technology or it could be related to naturopathy, for example, or it could be related to uh, um, you know, cooking, because, you know, Manipal is a multidisciplinary campus. And uh, so, you know, the, the idea is to kind of help them to bring, come in, and then, um, you know, and then, of course, we provide such, you know, learning spaces for them. And uh, even after their retirement or active work life, so they can come and enroll. And then, and uh, over a period of time, how do I see this can go is also, yeah, if the management permits, I think, you know, um, probably these older adults who are keen to work with young people, uh, because one of the important element is intergenerational work. That's what, you know, my research is all about. So I'm trying to kind of bring in that element and see if they could work with students of the university, not everybody, some of them, and also with the faculty members on the projects in which they have some idea or some expertise in, and uh, so that you know, uh, you know, kind of they feel more productive, they feel their well-being is promoted. So that's how I see it. Yes, thank you for this elaboration. And I would like to uh, talk about uh, the role of these older adults when they work together with faculty staff and so on. How do you see these older adults in this, uh, in this part? Are they a source of information? Are they stakeholders? Are they co-creators? How do you, can you uh, explain this? Okay, so that's a good question. I've, I've not thought about that, but however, I think my idea would be to, they, my, they should be 
probably some representations from the older adults to co-create the whole space. Because, you know, I might be wrong, um, or probably the university, if we don't have, you know, the people with similar orientations, you know, they might be wrong. So I would probably look at, um, you know, kind of getting people who are uh, of that age and also who have some sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, some sort of inclination towards being part of that space. And then um, also probably there are a few uh, researchers who are in touch with um, and also practitioners uh, probably kind of having a kind of a small consortium. So which of course, you know, there's already, we kind of formed it uh, as part of my research and which we had a first meeting in 2020. And we did discuss about these factors and, uh, you know, yeah, most of them said, yes, they would be happy to be part of it. So kind of bring back this consortium and then see uh, how do we take it forward and how do we create this space? Yes, thank you. I would like to continue uh, uh, um, uh, with uh, respect to the same paragraph, the impact paragraph, but I go to the final uh, um, uh, section and um, you address this and I cite again, we plan to add a novelty to this structure by taking steps to integrate this space into a larger uh, institutional setup of Manipal Academy of Higher Education, intending to promote intergenerational knowledge exchange platforms and project works in which the registers, uh, registered older uh, adults will share with the faculty members and uh, um, pres uh, present student community. End of the citation. My question relates to this novelty and you're uh, talking, you're writing about planning uh, to take steps. Could you please elaborate on these steps? What kind of steps would you like to, to take? Because this is very important um, for education. Right, yes, exactly, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. And yes, uh, so oh, the, was, that was the aura. As you may uh, finish your answer, you can also say enough is enough. <laughs> no, I will, I will try. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So I think probably, yes, you know, first, that will be the kind of, a, you know, follow up. So first would be that, you know, we will form the space and then we will enroll the, um, you know, older adults who would like to learn. And then based on their, uh, capacities and interest. Yeah, we then we will identify, um, you know, students, student projects or faculty projects, and then kind of, you know, bringing in that bridge or collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Time appointed. Uh, for, def for the defense of your thesis has passed. And the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. And I request that you and uh, everybody who's watching this uh, PhD defense await the results of our deliberation and our return. Come on. And we'll suspend the meeting.
Uh, let me see. Yeah, everybody's back. Um, Mr. Candidate, the audience, I reopened this meeting and Mr. Yahint Yotikaran, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and of your defense. And in view of its positive verdict and taken into account your uh, previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And Professor Krumeij is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Professor Krumeij. Yes. Oh, God. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? To be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? Yes, I do. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby by on, confer upon you, Teddy Andrews Jaihin Jotikaran, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the supervisor affixed with the official seal of the university, shown by the beadle. Dr. Teddy, I'm sure this is how you will be addressed in the coming years at Manipal University. Dr. Meersoek, Agnes and I have known you for many, many years. I met you as early as 2009 when I visited Manipal University to talk about collaboration in the field of global and public health. And since then Manipal University and Maastricht University have become uh, partners and still are. Agnes met you in 2010, I think, for the first time, when she organized the Manipal Symposium, a symposium in which the students of Manipal, Maastricht, uh, Canada, Sudan, Colombia, Thailand, etc., are coming together at your campus, at your host, your very welcoming campus. Since then, Agnes and I visit Manipal twice a year, have visited Manipal twice a year until the pandemic, of course. Uh, and then we have done a lot of meetings online. We did workshops with the staff. We uh, did uh, co um, courses with your students. And in, this in these visits, we did not only get to know cam the campus of Manipal and its people, Dr. Lina and Dr. R.T. Rao and so on very well, but especially you. And I think Agnes and I, and I speak all the time of us because I also speak on behalf of Agnes, we prepared this Laudatio more or less together because we couldn't make out who, whom of us would have the best uh, rights to speak to you because we both worked very pleasantly and intensely with you. Um, so we, I speak of us, but Agnes and I, we uh, see ourselves uh, as your personal friends now after all these years, we have met so often. And uh, so what I'm going to say to you is really on behalf of our both and it's heart felt from the bottom of our hearts. First of all, what we agreed upon first is that the very first impressions that we have of you in 2009 and 10 uh, are still spot on. We haven't changed and our opinion of you haven't cha hasn't changed either. We got to know you as kind, patient, approachable, never angry or frustrated, a safe person, a rock in the high waves of the sea, always ready to help students. I remember that you organized a microwave on a Sunday for one of our students because she needed to prepare a kosher meal. I also remember that during Eastern services, because when we are in Manipal, it's almost always Easter, you helped many students to find the right 
um, services for them and ceremonies and celebrations, but you also were indispensable for, and I'm sure for, for your colleagues, for us, for family, for friends, everybody relies on you and you have a great heart and apparently a lot of time. You're a very social person. You're also a very socially concerned person and all that makes you into a person with a huge social network and we sometimes wonder how you manage to prepare your work, your work on the PhD, your social network with your PhD work and all the other things that you have to do. And we wonder sometimes if you ever sleep and if you ever take time for yourself. I hope you will soon. In spite of all that work you managed to complete your PhD in time, not just managed to complete it, but also in the time that the grant allowed you for it, a little over four years you took. And the topic of the thesis reflects a huge social consciousness, conscience on your side and your concern with vulnerable people, typically for you, I would say. And you picked elderly. You could have picked many others because your heart, as I said, is, is large. And there were many other groups that you would like, have liked to write about, but you picked elderly people and their well-being. During our sessions, talking about your data and your PhD, we got an even better insight in, in you and your family. You were one of those people struggling to balance between being a good son, taking care of parents, asking parents also to take care of you, obviously. And um, so what you were talking about, you also experienced yourself on a very daily basis. And we discussed your, your feelings, your experiences, uh, and how you try to be a good son and how to uh, keep in touch and how to even uh, be close to your parents. We actually learned, and that was also insightful, that even though your topic was about India and it was about traditional Indian values and uh, ch changes to modern life, that we had a lot in common because Agnes and myself, we also struggled with the combination of being a good daughter in our case and our parents. And we found each other. We had interesting discussions in where we could say, hey, this is not so very different. Hey, we here we share. Here we share the struggles, the ambiguities. The... And so we got to learn your topic. We got to learn you, your family circumstances, and also during our visit, your family themselves. And I think we are not overdoing it when we say we became close friends, not only with you, but also with Jesse and Steffi and your parents, and maybe also your brother who lived upstairs, who also was involved in taking care of your parents. And so we shared a lot of lived experiences. And I hope that the friendship, friendship we developed will last us a long time and that, it, that our contacts will not end with the intensive contacts that we had during your thesis. I would really feel sorry that you completed your thesis if it would end with that. I hope also, and I'm sure uh, Manipal University recognizes you as the person you are. You are a unique combination of academic achievement. I think we all agreed that you did a great work, a good thesis, beautiful defense. Uh, you're academic achievement, your beautiful personality, your kindness, your patience, your reliability, your dedication, but also your managerial and organizational skills. You couldn't have done that, all that without them. And I think that would make you a great leader in the, in the future. I think you will be one of the leaders that we need that has eye for his people, who is kind and gentle and patient, but still manages and still organizes everything uh, with a, with a gentle, in a gentle way. So I hope you will be, and I'm sure, and I already know that you will be uh, able to uh, build on this and go further with your academic achievement, with your leadership, with your social networks. Um, and, but before you go back to work, I really hope that for once in all the 10, 12 years I know you, you will have some time to enjoy this for yourself and that you will have some time off before your new duties kick in. I would like to congratulate you, Teddy, you yourself with your great job. We are, I'm really impressed. I would like to congratulate your family, Jesse and Steffi, who 
had been have been indispensable to you. They have had a great role. I would like to congratulate Manipal University, your colleagues, and of course, Dr. Lina, who has been uh, involved in the supervision of your project uh, as well. Um, so I would start, I would like to say for the, la the last few words in this, well done, Teddy, congratulations. You deserve it. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Okay, dear, dear Dr. Yahint Yotikaran, also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you with the honor you have acquired. And I, of course, uh, congratulate your family and friends as well. And of course, your supervisors, Professor Krumer, Dr. Meersuk, and Dr. Ashok. And uh, I hope you have indeed the time to celebrate this uh, special day. And I hope for you a very a great life and a great career. I thank the members of the opposition for their um, work and the preparation of the questions and the assessment of the manuscript. And of course, the team, Joshua van Veru, Luke Peters and the Pedel for their work, because without them, we couldn't have this online sessions. So thank you all. And uh, hereby, I uh, close this meeting.